Good evening and welcome to the John F. Uh, Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Oscar Schulz. I'm a freshman at the college stu uh, studying economics. And I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and JFK side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Dr. Peter Navarro and Dean Almendorf. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me add my own slightly croaky but warm welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at Harvard Kennedy School. Our guest tonight is Peter Navarro. Uh, we are fortunate to have him here. Uh, his talk is titled, uh, Ricardo is Dead, Long Live, Fair, Balanced, and Reciprocal Trade. Uh, Peter is assistant to the President of the United States uh, and the director of the White House's Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. He uh, is an alumnus from Harvard, having a master's in public administration degree from the Kennedy School and a PhD in economics from Harvard. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of economics and public policy at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, as the director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy, Peter Navarro advises President Trump on policies to increase economic growth, decrease the trade deficit, and strengthen manufacturing in the United States. Prior to his appointment at the White House, uh, he served as an economic and trade advisor for Donald Trump in the 2016 campaign. Uh, he's the author of several books uh, on economics and financial market analysis. Uh, let me remind you that the learning process uh, at the Kennedy School uh, requires civil discourse without the chance for members of our community to both hear and be heard we would be a much less effective educational institution. Therefore, our speaker will, uh, tonight will offer his thoughts to start as always, but then also as always, um, we will have an open question and answer period that I will moderate. Uh, anyone who disrupts the program or interferes with the ability of all of us in the audience to learn what we have come to learn will be in violation of the university's official statement of rights and responsibilities will be asked to leave and will be subject to disciplinary action. Presuming that will not be an issue, um, we're in for a very interesting uh, discussion of economic policy over the next hour. Um, we're luck lucky to have Peter Navarro here and we welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here uh, 40 years ago uh, when I was here, this was it. One little building and the beginning of what's become a great dream uh, for Cambridge and Harvard. So congratulations to what you guys are doing. Uh, I have uh, three simple points I want to share with you tonight. Uh, first, cherish every moment you spend within the environs of Harvard and use your time to broaden and deepen your toolbox, hone your ethical compass, and invest in your career networks. Point two will be at least some of what you will learn at Harvard, which is right today, will almost certainly be wrong tomorrow because of changing circumstances, particularly technological change. And then point three, some of the conventional wisdom you will learn at Harvard, particularly in the area of international trade, uh, is at best outdated and at worst misleading. My message to you here is that the economics profession must do a much better job than David Ricardo at modeling trade in the real world. And those of you in the fields of politics and international relations must do much more than simply parrot the bullet points of a Ricardian free trade ideology that no longer has any relevance in global markets dominated by industrial espionage, rampant cheating, intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer, state capitalism, 
and currency misalignments. So before I get to those three points, what I want to do is just walk through a little bit of, of what, I, what I do at the White House and how I got there. Uh, as, as Doug said, I was part of the campaign. I'm in what uh, Kellyanne Conway calls one of the unbroken threads, one of the senior staff there who was with the president uh, during the campaign. Uh, my mission at the White House is to direct the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. This was an office that was established early in the presidency by executive order, and it was done both to up the administration's policy game uh, on trade and also sent a very strong signal that the men and women of America who work with their hands in our factories are critical to this nation's economic security and national security. Uh, the White House trade team that I work with is an incredibly rich uh, and diverse one, uh, both in expertise and perspective. And uh, it is at the vanguard of what I would argue is the most active and successful trade agenda of any modern president. Thanks to this forward-leaning trade agenda working synergistically with landmark efforts at tax cuts, deregulation, and the unleashing of our energy sector, the Trump administration has achieved what was unthinkable just a few years ago, which is a 3% real GDP growth rate in 2018. The Trump economic plan has also resulted in historically low unemployment rates for African Americans, Hispanics, and women, and a healthy rebound in real wage gains, with a dis disproportionate share of those gains being enjoyed by those in the lower segments of the income distribution. To help the president create high-paying, high-quality jobs, uh, what I do every day is, is, is a lot of different things. My portfolio is a very diverse one. Uh, for example, my team has worked on several Buy American, Hire American executive orders that have driven U.S. government spending on foreign goods down to its lowest point in 10 years. Buy American, Hire American, these are President Trump's two most simple rules. My, also, my office also helped coordinate the Pentagon's first comprehensive assessment of the defense industrial base since the days of Eisenhower. And this effort has borne significant fruit in terms of both identifying significant gaps and vulnerabilities in the defense industrial base and immediately filling those gaps. Uh, as just one vector of attack, we were significantly expanding the use of Defense Production Act Title III funds to, for example, expand manufacturing capabilities in such diverse areas as lithium seawater batteries for anti-submarine warfare and cutting-edge fuel cells for the Navy's future unmanned uh, underwater vehicles. My office has also been uh, involved with the development and implementation of the new what's called the conventional arms transfer policy that is creating jobs across the country even as it strengthens our strategic alliances with our partners and allies around the world. Just two days ago, I attended a ribbon cutting in Greenville, South Carolina for a new F-16 jet fighter production line that simply would not exist if it hadn't been for President Trump's business-oriented approach. This new F-16 production line will create more than 400 direct jobs in Greenville, about 1,100 more jobs in the surrounding communities and in South Carolina, and support up to 17,000 jobs across the United States in about 41 states. Clearly, what happens in Greenville doesn't stay in Greenville. And besides these economic benefits, our alliances in both the Middle East and Europe will be more stable as we transfer these systems to countries like Bahrain and Slovakia. Uh, my office also works on things that you might think are, are kind of small, uh, but we, which we regard which are very important in the scheme of things. A case in point is an executive order that was signed a few months ago that will help sea veterans in services like the Coast Guard and Navy seamlessly transition into six-figure jobs in the Merchant Marine. 
Um, this is what we call a, a, a proverbial twofer, as it helps our veterans transition to the civilian workforce, that's economic security, even as it enhances our national security by strengthening America's merchant marine, which is critical to U.S. military logistics. Most recently, my office working closely with the interagency and White House leaders like Jim Carroll and Kellyanne Conway have begun a series of initiatives to combat the flood of counterfeit goods and contraband such as fentanyl into this country. Uh, you may be disturbed to know, and this might be the best thing you can remember from this talk, but when you go online and order uh, uh, from a th what's called a third-party online marketplace, you've got a, about a 40% chance of getting a counterfeit right now, a 40% chance. You may also be disturbed to know that China kills tens of thousands of Americans every single year by using these online marketplaces to flood this country with fentanyl and other opioids and illegal drugs. Our policy goal is to turn this flood of contraband and counterfeits into a mere trickle. This will not only protect consumers and save American lives, but it will also create American jobs. So things for me are busy every day. At the White House, I have one of my uh, interns here, Harvard uh, Junior. Uh, he knows kind of what we did every day, and we were proud to have him. Uh, but I think America should be comforted to have a president who wakes up every day thinking about how to grow this economy faster and create jobs for Americans while protecting national security. So with that lengthy preamble, let me get down to the business at hand, which is to move through these three main points of these remarks. Point one on maximizing the Harvard experience. Uh, I was fortunate to spend time at this pinnacle of academia from 1977 to 1986, first as a student here at the Kennedy School and then across the street uh, as a PhD student. Um, in economics. During that time, I wrote my first two books and published my first journal article, and I thoroughly enjoyed every single resource here. Um, expansive libraries, top-notch computer facilities. By the way, <laughs> we used punch cards in those days. Just, just thought I'd share that with you. Um, large lecture halls steeped in tradition to small seminars brooming, brimming with battling high IQs and more than a few big egos. If I had anything to do over again, I would spend more time auditing classes outside my degree track. I would go to more lectures such as this. I would engage more fully with the Harvard community across the student and professor cadres. Please take that uh, uh, for what it, what it is. Because the real payoff from being here is what I've learned years later, it doesn't come from maximizing your GPA or even getting your degree, although be sure and do that. Um, the real payoff comes from leveraging the resources of this university to broaden and deepen your toolbox and from establishing those networks that are going to be so valuable to you over the course of your career. I will also note that since you're attending a school of government, my presumption is that you intend to devote your career to the public interest. Uh, if you were looking to get rich, you'd be across the river. Um, if serving the greater good is truly your calling, there's some interesting ethical questions that await you. Among them may be this. If you go to Washington and find yourself working for a congressman, a senator, a president, you must ask yourself this. Are you there to advance your own priorities or that of your principal? Or perhaps are you there simply to provide more nonpartisan advice partisan advice based on toolbox analytics. And can you truly and ethically do that if you have strong ideological or political views that you wish to advance, promote, or proselytize? These are no small questions because based on my time at the White House, I can assure you there are far too many DC bureaucrats in what some have called the deep state who never got elected but who somehow think they know better than the elected officials they serve. Please hear this. There's no ethical high ground to be found in such disloyalty, only a road to ruinous harm to our democracy. 
Let's turn now to point two. At least some of what you will be learning at Harvard today will certainly be wrong tomorrow as time, tides, and technology change. Uh, the case study I want to use is from right here um, in this building uh, in the quest for U.S. energy independence. Uh, what I matriculated here in 1977, we were deep in the fog of what President Jimmy Carter called the moral equivalent of war, and cardigan sweaters were all the rage. We were urged to shiver, um, if not in the dark, then certainly uh, in the dim light. During this time, the economic and national security arguments for energy independence certainly appeared compelling. OPEC, or, uh, the oil cartel, uh, had victimized us with several uh, embargoes. Our macro economy and, and industrial base were dangerously exposed to the recessionary shocks of, of oil price shocks. And we ran a very real national security risk of being drawn into foreign wars to ensure a dependable supply of oil. These were dark times in the 70s. It's not something you, you would have enjoyed living through. And within that world, it was easy as economists to make the negative externalities case for weaning the nation off for foreign oil using aggressive and ambitious government industrial policies. Some analysts wanted to build more coal and nuclear plants to displace foreign oil. In 1984, I published my first book called The Dimming of America on this subject. Others made the case for large subsidies and complex regulations to steer America down a so-called soft path to energy independence with windmills and solar farms. My own view at the time was that the smart path was to pursue both hard and soft path options. But I agreed with the central premise of the median policy analyst that the overriding mission was to get the U.S. economy off oil, particularly OPEC oil. During this quest for energy independence, I was blessed to work with great men and great minds right here at Harvard. In fact, I went over the directory to see how many were still left. Um, one gentleman who didn't work here was Tom Stauffer. I owe a tremendous debt to him. But the rest of the guys are still here. It's Bill Hogan, Henry Lee, Joseph Colt, and Dale Jorgensen. And together, these five, five gentlemen, they, they have IQs probably approaching 1,000, but not one of them ever fully anticipated the fracking revolution. And, and how could they? But uh, this profound change in the technology associated with petroleum extraction has turned the U.S. in, and this is remarkable, into the world's largest oil producer. Remarkable. And as for that quest for energy independence, we've gone from net oil imports of about 10 million barrels a day in 2005, and we're down to about 4 million barrels today. And U.S. exports have jumped 259% since President Trump took office. These gains represent a twin triumph of technology and Trump energy policy, and no one I ever worked with here, no one, ever dreamed this was possible in the figurative and quite literal dark days of the 70s. The broader message of this is this. As you move forward in your career, never forget to question first principles. Continually revisit what you think you know. The world changes quickly. You must exhibit flexibility, adaptability, and open-mindedness. Better yet, stay ahead of the curve. To quote the great Wayne Gretzky, don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where the puck's going to be. And with that hockey analogy as my segue in this great hockey town, let me turn to point three because I've been skating to this particular trade-related puck for the better part of a decade while getting body-checked by most of my profession. Here's my point. The more than 200-year-old Ricardian model of free trade that most of you were taught in, if you ever took economics, has little or no relevance to the reality of an international trading regime driven by a set of unfair and discriminatory acts policies and practices that put United States farmers, ranchers, manufacturers, and workers at a severe competitive disadvantage. The Cliffsnose version of this Ricardian model is this. Free trade is good because when two countries move away from autarky to economic engagement, each will have a comparative advantage in the production of a set of goods. 
production will shift in each country to producing more of the goods each has a comparative advantage in. Resources will be allocated more efficiently and the gross domestic products, voila, of these countries will be larger than they otherwise would be. Through these so-called gains from trade, both countries will be better off. Or so the Ricardian song is sung. Of course, nowhere will there ever appear in the Cliff Notes or in any of the economic principles textbooks upon which the Cliff Notes are based, including your beloved Mancu, right? The possibility that one or both trading partners will lie, spy, cheat, or steal. But consider, for example, five of the worst forms of economic aggression engaged in by the People's Republic of China. Number one, Chinese cyber soldiers regularly hack the computers of American corporations to steal trade secrets. Number two, Chinese entrepreneurs steal hundreds of billions of dollars every year of intellectual property from American corporations manufacturing everything from sprinklers and running shoes to railroad cars and unmanned aerial systems. Number three, China's government agencies forcibly transfer technology from American companies seeking access to the Chinese market. Number four, unfairly subsidized state-owned enterprises dump everything from steel and aluminum to electronics and rolling stock into the U.S., thereby grabbing market share and putting American companies out of business. And five, People's Bank of China has historically manipulated the Chinese currency to stimulate Chinese exports and depress foreign imports. If Ricardo were alive today, what would he say about this deviant economic model? It, it is an interesting question. I dare say none of you have probably been asked that in any of your economics classes, but maybe it's time that those kind of questions be asked. But it's not just China's economic aggression bedeviling the international trading order. As the United States trade representative has extensively documented, unfair trading practice continue to do not dominate virtually the entire landscape of international trade. Major part of the problem is the institutionalization of non-reciprocal tariffs by the World Trade Organization. This is going to be really important for each one of you to understand. The WTO was established in 1994 as the successor to the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade. It's got 164 members, 23 observer government, and it's the, the WTO is the primary international body that both sets and governs the rules of international trade. Now, listen to this carefully. This is, this, this is hard to parse. A cornerstone of the WTO's non-reciprocal trading system is something called the most favored nation rule. This MFN rule requires each WTO member to apply the lowest tariffs it applies to the products of any one country to the products of every other WTO country. Okay? But, but here's the catch. Nothing in this MFN rule requires a WTO member to provide equal, that is, reciprocal or mirror tariff rates to its trading partners. Rather, WTO members are free under the most favored nation rule to charge systematically higher tariffs to other countries so long as they do that to everybody else. Think about that. So, here's an example for you. This, this is kind of crazy as we see. Under the MFN rule, the, the MFN tariff for autos applied by the U.S. is 2.5%. Europe charges a tariff four times higher than that at 10%. China's is 15%, and India's in the stratosphere at 125%. All perfectly legal under the World Trade, o, tra trade Organization. Does anybody here think that's fair? Any takers? A little audience participation time? Now, here's some more bad news for free and fair traders regarding the WTO. From a strategic game theory point of view, the WTO's most favored nation rule provides little or no incentive for higher tariff countries to come to the negotiating table to lower their tariffs. Think about this. The dominant strategy of any relatively high tariff country is to simply to maintain those high tariffs while free riding off the lower tariff countries. And so who gets hurt most? Well, it's countries like the U.S. that have some of the lowest tariffs on average. 
My office at the White House has been carefully documenting the extent of these non-reciprocal tariffs, and I'm going to give you a startling statistic. I, 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 nobody's ever calculated this before, so here it is. Across 132 countries that the U.S. does not have free trade agreements with, and those would include countries like Brazil, China, and India, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. Across those 132 countries, those countries apply higher tariffs than the U.S. applies on them almost 80% of the time, almost 80% of the product lines, okay? Let's, let's think about that. Almost 80% of the time, American exporters face significantly higher tariffs than their foreign competitors face in U.S. markets. Again, anybody think that's fair? I think not. It's precisely because of this fundamental lack of reciprocity that President Trump, in his 2019 State of the Union address, urged Congress to pass the U.S. Reciprocal Trade Act. This legislation is carried by Representative Sean Duffy of Wisconsin. It's modeled after the highly successful 1934 Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act, and it would provide the president with the authority to raise tariffs to the levels of our foreign trading partners if they refuse to lower their tariffs down to ours. To most Americans, and I've got to thank Harvard for this. You'll see why in a second. To most Americans... This proposed legislation is just plain common sense. A February Harvard-Harris poll of 1,934 registered voters found that 81% of respondents support the U.S. Reciprocal Trade Act, and there was little variance between Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And here's what I can tell you based on more than two years of experience at the White House, absent appropriate statutory authorities, such as the U.S. Reciprocal Trade Act, America, the piggy bank, will continue to be plundered by a trade deficit that transfers more than half a trillion dollars of American wealth a year to foreign lands. These observations lead me to yet another piece of conventional fossilized wisdom propagated right here in the, uh, academia. Namely, that trade deficits don't matter. Trade deficits don't matter. Let's think about that. America's run a trade deficit every year since 1975. In 2018, the U.S. trade deficit in goods hit a record $878 billion. And county services, the overall deficit hit a 10-year high of $622 billion. And thinking about why America's large and persistent trade deficits do indeed matter, I'm going to bring in that, that legendary Marxist Warren Buffett, right? the crazy radical Warren Buffett. Here's what he has to say about trade deficits. Our country has been behaving like an extraordinarily rich family that possesses an immense farm. In order to consume 4% more than we produce, that's the trade deficit, we have day by day been both selling pieces of the farm and increasing the mortgage on what we still own. And how about this straight talk from President Trump? The jobs and wealth have been stripped from our country year after year, decade after decade, trade deficit after trade deficit. These trade deficits matter. They represent a pernicious transfer of wealth precisely because they represent a future claim on American assets by foreign hands. And with these trade deficits, foreigners are allowed to buy with relatively few restrictions everything from income producing stocks and bonds to real capital assets such as businesses, farmland, and other forms of real estate. Quoting Buffett again, he, he describes these, it's a beautiful phrase here, he describes these wealth transfers as colonization by purchase. Colonization by by purchase. As of June 2017, foreign entities held $18.3 trillion in U.S. income generating long-term securities, including $7.1 trillion in equities and $11 trillion in debt. These observations bring me right back to the failed Ricardian model because guess what? Guess what? These large and persistent trade deficits aren't even supposed to exist because what's supposed to happen 
is currency adjustments, right? In the Ricardian model, if one country runs a persistent trade deficit, we're doing a little economics here, its currency will pile up in the other country and its currency will devalue. With a cheaper currency then, the deficit country will then export more, import less, and trade will come back into balance. End of story, everybody lives happily ever after in the model. Problem is, there isn't any prosperous ending here at all, at least for many American farmers, ranchers, manufacturers, workers, because these currencies don't adjust, and we continue to have these large trade deficits. As to which countries are, in the language of President Trump, looting the piggy bank the worst, I have got a figure up there you can take a look at. It illustrates America's largest bilateral trade deficits in goods. If you look at the biggest slice of the pie, it's China at $419 billion. It's about 48% of the total. The EU at $169 billion takes a big bite, but half of that's Germany. And then you got China, the EU, Japan, and Mexico account for over 80% of that deficit. I'm, I'm going to go a little literature on you because this was my undergraduate uh, major in college, right? So when I look at this, I think of how Tolstoy began his famous book, Anna Karenina. It goes, happy families are all alike. Unhappy families, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. This chart reminds me of that Tolstoy quote because true and happy free traders are all alike in their love of no trade barriers. But each of the countries in this chart are different in their own unhappy ways in the unfair trade practices they use to exploit America. India, some of the highest tariffs in the world. In contrast, Japan, some of the lowest tariffs, but some of the highest non-tariff barriers. Countries like Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, in their proverbial race to the bottom, they gain a lot of edge simply by lax labor and environmental standards, which are well below environmental norms. But what all of these countries on that chart share in common is a set of acts policies and practices that lead to unfair, non-reciprocal, and persistently unbalanced trade with the United States, with the result being this large and persistent trade deficit. Now here again, you may find it curious that the linkage I've just made between unfair trade practices and the trade deficit is not accepted by the economics profession. Just not accepted. It's intuitive, but they're not buying it. The vast majority of economists dismiss the role of tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and other mercantilist and protectionist policies as contributing factors to the U.S. trade deficit. What's their explanation? They use the macroeconomic accounting identity that a trade deficit is broadly equal to the value of investment over savings to blame America's trade deficits on a low American savings rate. Okay. In other words, it's not unfair trade practices, but profligate American consumers that are to blame for this trade deficit. This is a serious flawed argument because it assumes that the U.S. savings rate is determined exogenously, that is, independent of the various tax, regulatory, wage, and other policies, not just of the U.S., but also of its trading partners. In fact, both the savings and investment rates of all nations are heavily dependent on, that is, endogenous to, these policy vectors. For example, when America's trading partners unfairly subsidize exports and production, American consumers face artificially low prices. In such an environment of unfair trade, it's perfectly rational for Americans to consume more and save less, with the result being a trade deficit that's higher than it would otherwise be. Sometimes the distortions introduced into the world's savings and investment patterns by mercantilist policies are more subtle. Uh, Germany, for example, deflationary wage policies depress consumer expenditures, while an austere fiscal policy suppresses government expenditures. From a pure macro 
economic point of view, the, the logical result down the road becomes a German trade surplus that is the largest in the world both in absolute terms and relative to their GDP. They've been criticized very heavily for that. Here's the broader point. While savings and investment patterns are ultimately tied to trade flows and current account balances by a macro economic accounting identity, the pattern of savings and investment in any country are also endogenous and influenced heavily by both foreign and trade, foreign and domestic policy vectors. There's a really important inference to be made here. It's that the United States can reduce its trade deficit by adopting appropriate and appropriately defensive trade policies, and that's exactly what the U.S. is doing under President Donald J. Trump. Fair, balanced, and reciprocal trade represents a cornerstone of Trump trade policy. So what, what has the president been doing? Well, a level of the international playing field, the Trump administration has negotiated two of the worst trade deals ever cut, NAFTA and the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. We've also announced plans to negotiate new trade deals with the United Kingdom, Japan, and the European Union. Beyond these trade negotiations, President Trump is using an array of statutory authorities to raise tariffs on select products to address economic security and national security concerns. For example, in March of 2018, President Trump applied a 25% tariff on steel and a 10% tariff on aluminum under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. These tariffs now defend two key pillars of America's manufacturing and defense industrial base in the interests of national security. And stripped of rhetoric, President Trump's tariffs on steel and aluminum represent one of the most su successful applications of a defensive trade policy in U.S. history. What have we seen? It's, it's been truly remarkable. Billions of dollars of new investment have poured into these industries. Capacity utilization uh, in employment are up. After a brief spike, prices are coming down, just as theory would predict. Meanwhile, the downstream industries that were supposed to be hurt are creating all sorts of uh, new jobs and not seeing decreases as the critics warned. More broadly, and this, this is astonishing too, if you were around over the last decade hearing about how manufacturing jobs are gone forever, the Trump administration has created over half a million new manufacturing jobs in just two years. This compares to the loss of almost 200,000 jobs manufacturing jobs during the lost Obama years. The abiding fact of Trump trade policy is this. In the spirit of Hamilton, Lincoln, and McKinley, tariffs are working to level the playing field between America and much of the rest of the world. The imposition or threat of tariffs is also finally and firmly bringing other partners to the bargaining table. And I can tell you this, they wouldn't be coming to the table if it were not for the tariff policies. And through this far more muscular and nuanced trade policy, the Trump administration has become a positive if disruptive force in moving a broken world trading system far closer to the textbook ideal of fair, balanced, and reciprocal trade. In closing, let me say it's long past time for the ivory tower to reimagine and re-engineer its models of trade so that they can form far better to the realities of the international trading arena and the very real plight of the people who live not in Cambridge or Manhattan or Bonn or Brussels, but rather in the factory towns of America and across the ranches and farms in this great country. And for those of my Ricardian colleagues who continue to resist such long overdue change, I will simply remind you of what Professor Paul Samuelson once said about the difficult and painful transition from classical economics to Keynesianism in the 1930s. Quip Samuelson, science advances funeral by funeral. I just hope I'm still around to see my own economics profession advance beyond the bankrupt Ricardian model. Ricardo is indeed dead. Under President Trump, long live free, fair, and balanced trade. 
So I thank you for uh, your patience here. And uh, Doug's going to come up, and uh, we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. By the, by the way, I, I'm not getting near his shaking his hand. It's, it's not that I don't love him. He's just sick I'm, as a dog. I'm and quite sick. So I'm going to stay <laughs> way back in the corner. Um, he so, was, so he was almost speechless when he heard I was coming tonight. <laughs> so the, fl the floor is open, um, and there are microphones uh, down here and then up on the balconies partway. Um, who would like to lead us off? I see people hovering nearby. Please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, my question is, I'm, I'm uh, Dimas from HKS. Um, I'm from Indonesia, and my question is pertaining to... I couldn't to tell. Can anybody tell? <laughs> um, it's, it's a sweatshirt. Yeah. It's in, <laughs> um, my question is pertaining to the developing countries' perspectives yes, as sir. to your argument. Um, one of the principles of the WTO is special and differential treatment, which recognizes that fairness does not really necessarily mean that a developing and developed country should be held to the exact same standard because that would in fact be unfair because developing countries would then have no development space to um, nurture their economy. In fact, as you said, with the spirit of Lincoln and Hamilton, they strongly believe that when a country is developing, it requires greater protection for the economy to take off. So taking this into account, um, if you put yourselves in the developing country's position, um, wouldn't you do the same of granting more protection so that these countries can catch up the way that the United States did under Lincoln and um, Hamilton's spirit? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I do know that uh, the United States trade representatives just sent um, letters out uh, basically uh, telling China and India that uh, they, we, we are treating them going forward as developed countries. So I guess it's a question of degree. I take your point, but um, I think that there's also the case that can be made that if, if all countries are held accountable to the same standards, uh, we can avoid sweatshops, pollution havens, and the race to the bottom. I mean, I, I, Indonesia is a great country. Um, it would be uh, uh, unfortunate if, if it were to join that race to the bottom. What else you got? Over here. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, so my question is... I'm sorry, can you identify yourself and then oh, ask your question? I'm Michael Chang. I'm a first year at the college. Uh, so my question is, if you could adopt any trade policies you wanted, irrespective of if it would be practical or not, what policies would you adopt and why? In other words, what, were you, what would your trade utopia be? <laughs> A trade utopia, yeah. So, um, I, you know, I don't even want to go to utopia. I think that's the problem with academia. They're always in a utopia. I look at the real world. So what I want for America, and it's America first, I want a, a, a trading system which is fair, reciprocal, and balanced. And this whole notion that uh, under the rules of a multilateral organization that 80% of the time they can charge us higher tariffs and put up higher non-tariff barriers, uh, that's, that's, that's not utopia to me. Let's stay out of utopia. Too much utopia in, in academia. Yeah. Okay, up here. Hi, <coughs> Jay Gleason. Um, regarding the CAT, the uh, uh, conventional arms transfers, uh, which you've been promoting recently, uh, the U.S., of course, is uh, by far and away the leading arms uh, merchant in the world, uh, but a lot of these arms are going to countries like uh, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and many others that have horrible uh, human rights uh, records. And I'm wondering, uh, certainly questions are being asked uh, whether there's too much emphasis put on uh, the presumed economic benefits of uh, this policy and far too little on the human rights concerns. Uh, that are being uh, perhaps neglected uh, with it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very serious and important question you're asking, sir. And I was, uh, uh, I was heavily involved in crafting the conventional arms transfer policy. And there is, there is a tension between uh, the issues of human rights and, and, and delivering these systems to our allies and partners in, in different parts of the world. Um, here's what I can tell you, again, living in the real world. Uh, during uh, the Obama years with the previous policy, when we took 
the, 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 the ground, I won't even call it the high ground, when we took the ground that we weren't going to sell these systems to people that we were actually had alliance with and partnerships, um, all that happened was the Chinese and Russians came in and sold them the weapons. And they did so without the stringent kind of preconditions now that we impose. Keep in mind that this CAT policy, conventional arms transfer policy, includes a very rigorous uh, set of processes where the State Department's involved in, in weighing these human rights issues and ensuring that we have certain controls over uh, the systems, ensuring where they do and don't go. So I, I hear you, but again, um, in, the, in the real world, we think our policy is better. Uh, we think that when we sell uh, a, a a THAAD missile defense system uh, to Saudi Arabia or, or when, we, when we sell a Patriot missile uh, to another ally or when we sell an F-16 to Slovakia. Uh, we're, we're strengthening our NATO alliance. We're making alliances more stable, Middle East. We have fewer boots on the ground perhaps needed for America and we're creating American jobs. So um, keep in mind that this, these sales don't take place in a vacuum. China and Russia are very, very aggressive. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, uh, when we compete with China, we're often competing against our own designs, which they stole from us because they've pretty much stolen every design imaginable. But great question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Over here next. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm, my name is Noah Redlick. I'm a sophomore at the college uh, studying history and literature. Um, I've largely actually agreed with the administration's trade policies. I think it was fantastic that you guys withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was a disastrous deal. Um, and that you've been renegotiating NAFTA. But uh, my question was, why haven't you installed Buy American provisions? Um, I know that there was a Buy American Week, but why has there not been a rule put in place where if the government's going to do contracts, it only does contracts with Buy American, with Made in American uh, companies? So um, I, I, my office actually was the tip of the spear on uh, two Buy American orders so far. Uh, we did one uh, early in 2017, which has been very successful at changing the culture across the interagency. The previous culture was, yeah, buy Americans, okay, but we're going to grant waivers. So we have waivers are down, I think, over the last fiscal year, 16%. And we do have, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, foreign content down to its lowest level um, in 10 years. And then just recently, within, I think, the last five to six weeks, uh, the president signed an order which uh, extends buy American provisions to what's called federal financial assistance. Uh, prior um, to, to that order, if, if the government spent money, say the Department of Transportation, directly on building a road or bridge through a contractor, that was under Buy America provisions. But if, if the federal government gave federal money to a state to, buy, to build a road, that wasn't necessarily covered. So um, this is a, a passion of mine at, at my office. Uh, we've done two so far. We got two more which are in development, and um, uh, buy America, hire America, as the president said many times, is the two simple rules. So great question. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my name is Robert Capitolupo, and I'm a senior at Harvard College. Uh, so in your talk, you spoke about the process of using tariffs uh, or the threat of tariffs as a way to get other countries to um, reciprocally lower their tariffs. Um, then in other parts of the talk, you alluded to the fact that tariffs were sort of a desirable end to protect uh, U.S. manufacturing. So uh, do you think that that protectionism is a, is a desirable end in itself or only the means to getting other countries to lower the... Uh, lower their trade barriers and then have so, a So I love this question because uh, it, it brings in appropriate texture and granularity. So let's take um, two situations. Uh, first of all, the steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, the problem we uh, were and continue to face uh, for steel and aluminum um, is this. First of all, you have to buy off on the assumption that in order to be uh, a, a great country and be able to defend yourself, you need steel and aluminum industries. I, I totally agree with that, as does the president, 
and folks in our administration. So once you, once you accept that premise, then you have to ask yourself the question, how can you ensure that those industries exist? Now, the problem we face is that um, there's tremendous overcapacity around the world. It's primarily driven by China, but pretty much every country around the world loves to have a steel industry because they're good jobs and they need it for their own national security. So we, we were faced, we took office with a situation with, where there was an overhang of overcapacity about 50% higher than the actual demand needed. I mean, a tremendous pushing down, and it's, it's like 20 different countries doing this. So the only way in that case to nurture and defend your, your industries is through a tariff ring around the country uh, that, that doesn't single out any, any one country, but simply says, we're going to put a tariff high enough right out of our economic textbooks in order to ensure that the 30 million tons a year of imports that we, we, we import every year goes down to 20, right? So in that case, tariffs are an end of, in, of itself to achieve national uh, security and economic security. Uh, if you look at um, some of the other things uh, that we've been doing, um, if you look, for example, at the Section 301 uh, action that the United States Trade Representative uh, did against China, this was uh, an action that has been designed to defend our intellectual property and technology from a variety of practices which I'd again described in my talk. Um, one of the beneficial uh, results of that has been to kickstart uh, a, a, a set of negotiations that are ongoing as we speak. So I don't know how those are going to end, and it's not my place to talk about that, but um, that would be a case where, where we wouldn't be sitting at the bargaining table without the Section 301. The Europeans wouldn't be coming talking to us about putting more... Uh, capacity here in uh, the United States to build their cars here instead of there if there wasn't the specter of, for example, the auto tariffs. But that's a good question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Please. Over here? Yes, then we'll go upstairs, please. Uh, Liz Allison, and while I kept Ricardo... What's your name? Liz Allison. You, are you the wife of the dean? By any, or, or the, Graham? Just um, curious. I am the wife of the former dean. Oh, uh, great. I, I'm I, so sorry you couldn't be here today. I, I, anyway, ask your question. Uh, I'll, share your, I'll share that sentiment with him. Thank you. Uh, but I am also the person who kept Ricardo on the reading list for generations of at 10 students at Harvard. And therefore, I wish to ask you a more conceptual question. Your talk to this point has involved exclusively a discussion of goods, merchandise. If you are going to replace the old, outmoded, Ricardian paradigm with the new and better paradigm, could you talk to us about capital flows and services? Sure. And, and by the way, uh, I was blessed uh, to be able to teach Act 10 when I was here for several years. And if, uh, if, if, you know, if you're a doctoral student, you get a chance to do that. It was a tremendous way of learning what I needed to do so that when I actually got a job in academia, uh, it was a little, little bit more of a transition. So, um, look, um, I don't know if you intend this, but there's a, there's a question embedded in there that's a bigger question about whether the world's heading more towards a service sector economy and whether manufacturing is dead and things like that. And, and, and in that kind of world, um, there are real interesting qu other questions to ask. But um, to me, uh, I think the Ricardian model, if you just applied it straight, could apply to goods or services. I, I don't see really a difference. But in terms of the investment flows, the, 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 the point I was trying to make in terms of, of the trade deficit is that savings and investment patterns are dependent on these policy vectors. I mean, for tax policy, for example, everybody knows that when you change your tax policy, that's going to change your level of investment, right? But, but for some reason, the economics profession hasn't been able to make the leap, well, trade policy, investment, savings, investment. That's the best I can do. 
Can I just say that uh, I was the head section leader for Act 10 uh, about 30 years ago, um, and when I was the head section leader, people talked about this famous former head section leader, Elizabeth Allison. So I was, knew about Liz Allison long before I knew were, about were other, after other Larry Allisons. Goulder? Were you after Larry Goulder or before? Before. Okay. So it's always Fascinating. Nice to see you, Liz. Please, up here. Thank you. So my name is Sylvie Foquet. I'm working for the European Union, and I'm following an executive program here at uh, Kennedy School. So my question is, you said in your speech that uh, industries that were supposed to be hurt by the increase in tariff, in fact, are now creating new jobs. How do you explain this? And what's the impact that you expect on those industries? I didn't quite get that. I'm sorry, you said it again. Please. Yeah, so what's the impact that you expect on uh, the industry that should normally be affected by the increase in tariff? And you said that those industries were creating new jobs. How can you explain this? You're saying so, yeah, the, U the U.S. industries that you said have been yes, creating the US, jobs. The U.S. industry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So um, I think I go back to the, the earlier question here. It's like tariffs, tariffs in the case of things like steel and aluminum where you want to defend those industries from, for example, a, a flood of foreign imports. Um, they will certainly create uh, domestic jobs here in America, attract in investment. Um, in the case, I mean, look, in, in the best case scenario, it would be lovely if we traded with Europe in a way where your tariffs were as low as ours and you didn't use things like your European harmonized standards basically to keep our products out. I mean, Europe, for example, um, <clears throat> If you want to sell a car in Europe, not only do you face a tariff four times higher, but you've got to abide by their harmonized standards for safety and environment. Now, those standards aren't any better or more stringent than the United States. They're just different, and they add $3,000 to the price of a car, and they make it harder to sell cars in the U.S. So um, I'd love it if Europe were, were to kind of come down to U.S. levels and get rid of those non-tariff barriers. And I mean, Europe, for example, this is a kind of interesting too, not to pick on Europe, but why not? Um, <laughs> so Europe now is, is doing free trade agreements with other countries where the other countries sign on to these standards and then they force those other countries by the, by the agreement to use those standards and then they keep American products not, out, not just out of Europe, but they make it harder for American products to go into those other countries. So this is kind of the, this is kind of the world we live in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry to be so uh, tough on you, but. Please up here, and we're running out of time, so please be brief. Sure, thank you, sir. My name's Ben Porter, and I'm a senior at the college. Uh, the president has made a priority of decreasing uh, domestic regulation, which makes the United States a more attractive place to invest. But sir, this necessarily uh, increases net capital inflows and therefore decreases net exports, growing the trade deficit. Uh, how do you reconcile your priority of decreasing trade deficits uh, with the president's choice? So, um, look, uh, I've always been a general equilibrium guy, right? A lot of economics is done, partial equilibrium. They just look at what happens in specific markets. Um, I think the... Uh, third book I wrote was called If It's Raining in Brazil by Starbucks, okay? And what it was about investing from a macro point of view, and the whole idea was that if it rained in Brazil to break a drought, coffee beans would be cheaper, Starbucks costs would be lower, their profits would be higher, so if you saw that, you could buy Starbucks stock and skate to that puck and make a, make a bunch of money, right? So my point is, to in addressing your, 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 your question, there's a lot of things that shape savings and investment and trade deficits and trade patterns and things like that. I mean, when the Fed raises interest rates, that has an impact. When we cut our taxes, that has an impact. Um, but I can tell you this, this the, the simple answer to your question is that America's large and persistent trade deficit would not exist in the absence of all these unfair trade practices. And so um, that's kind of the, 
the lane I'm in at the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy at the White House, and that's the lane I'm going to stay in, and there you go. Okay. I'm afraid it is 7 o'clock. We're out of time. Uh, thank you all very much. Pierre Navarro, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.